Yeah, so welcome everyone, dear colleagues, members and partners of the Global Donor Platform thematic working group on relief employment. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here for our uh, first joint webinar hosted by the group. Uh, my name is Frank Bertelmann. I work for GIZ Global Project Rural Employment with focus on youth. And I would like to welcome you as one of the chairs of, the, of our working group. So the working group was established back in 2018, but has recently been repositioned under the new Global Donor Platform Secretariat at IFAD. And with FAO and GIZ um, have been taken over as the new group chair. So it's our first of uh, this kind of webinar, and uh, we are very pleased to, to have you on board. So the main focus of our working group is on knowledge, knowledge exchange and engage, engaging in relevant policy processes through a collaborative action of member institutions and all relevant stakeholders. And this is exactly what we want to do today and achieve today on the topic of more inclusive pathways for structural transformation for a brighter future of work for youth in rural areas. So we are very pleased to have Bernd Miller from the ILO with us, and he will bring in an inspiring and I think also a thought provoking keynote based on his uh, uh, recent article, uh, and which is really well written and evidence based uh, with a, a title of Rural Youth Employment in Sub-Saharan Africa, Moving Away from Urban Myth and Towards Structural Policy Solutions. So uh, welcome Bernd, really happy to have you on board. And then after the keynote, um, we will have a panel discussion to reflect on the different findings of the keynote and the implications, policy implications from different institutional perspective with uh, distinguished panelists from the African Union Commission, of course, focusing more on the continental policy perspective. Then we have the research perspective represented by Yara, the Young African Researchers in Agricultural Network. Then we have the labor market perspective with you, views and insights from the ILO Regional Office for Africa. And last but not least, uh, a donor perspective represented by USAID, who are currently preparing also a new pro uh, program on the topic. But of course, uh, first of all, we would also like to engage with you and discuss with you. So please feel free uh, to comment, to ask questions, and to also contribute your own experiences and perspectives uh, in the chat function. Uh, this you can do all the time, but as well as um, through the microphone during the Q&A session after the panel. So, and also please note that the webinar will be recorded and uh, we just collected a couple of netiquettes um, on this welcome slide, which I don't see at the moment, but I think you have already so seen in the beginning and maybe Lisa, you can share it once more. Right, so um, with this, I'm really looking forward to an exciting uh, webinar and fruitful discussion on the uh, right strate strategic entry points for the promotion of decent rural employment and structural transformation in Africa. I think it's really a broad topic, a, a very relevant one, and also the connection between uh, rural transformation and job creation, I think is really a crucial one. And with, uh, with this, uh, I would uh, like to hand over to, uh, to Bernd, but before I also announce Mauricio Navarra from the Global Donor Platform Secretariat, who will be our moderator for today. And I would also like to thank all the colleagues from the ILO, from our working group, but also all the panelists for the excellent preparation. And with this, I just would like to introduce um, Bernd Müller again. Uh, he's employment specialist in ILO's decent work team for Eastern and Southern Africa. He's holding a PhD in economics from the SOAS at the U University of London and has uh, more than 10 years of experience, both as a development practitioner, a policy advisor, and also researcher on topics of labor markets and employment, especially focusing on Sub-Saharan Africa. So without further ado, I uh, hand over to Bernd, and we are very much looking forward to your keynote. Thanks, Frank, uh, and, and welcome everyone, and thanks for having me. And I'm very, really very much looking forward to this. Let me just open my slides so that we can start. All right, there we go. So I hope you can all see this. I hope you can hear me and, and, and thanks for joining. I'm really excited about this. It, it should be hopefully an interesting discussion. As Frank has said, I'm trying to be a bit thought uh, provoc 
thought provoking or even provocative in my in my presentation. It, it is based on this article that I've written. Uh, I think you've seen the, the link in the invitation. It's also at the end of the slides and I'm sure we'll share them later. Um, I, I'll try to make this participative and then and, um, participatory and then and also ask you a few questions in between. But overall, please bear with me in the sense that I'm trying to come up with a certain broad brush type of argument here. So there's a lot of nuance to the issues that I'm trying that I'm trying to raise and so on. And of course, we can go into so much detail in each and every one of those. But still, at the same time, trying to be evidence based and, 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 and come up with something that challenges our thinking a little bit about rural development work and maybe rural youth employment, which is so important for Africa in particular. So with that as a basis, Maybe can I ask you in the chat box, just type your answer in one word. What is the main socioeconomic reason why rural African youth face poverty? So can I invite you to just go to the chat box and very quickly type the first word that comes to mind. What is the main socioeconomic reason why rural, rural African youth face poverty? And uh, let me just see that I open the chat box so I can see some of your contributions. Okay. Ah, somehow I can't see the chat box. How did this happen now? Ah, there it is. Okay. Unemployment, lack of education, inequality, rising inequality, lack of access to productive resources, I see. Uh, we don't, act, agriculture does not pay enough. Okay, very good, interesting. Limited access to markets, uh, lack of infrastructure, limited knowledge, lack of institutional capacities, uh, infrastructure issues uh, in terms of connection to markets. Wonderful. Now, this is great. Uh, and then, and of course, lack of opportunities across the board. Very good. So there's a lot of issues that are coming Board and I'm trying. I think I will talk about quite a few of those and then keep it coming, of course. Um, what I usually have in these type of talks, one, one thing that we usually hear immediately is unemployment. Unemployment is a common reply, and of course, it's also the centerpiece uh, youth unemployment of this presentation. So I wanted to get into that straight away. And I will actually, sorry, I should have said this from the start, I will, I will try and structure this talk around a certain set of what I call urban myths. Uh, myths that often are, are related to when we think about an um, uh, employment and, and, and especially employment in rural Africa and rural development issues. I want to address these again a bit provocatively in order to, to challenge our thinking and see whether this is, might be the best way of how we approach things or whether there might be other ways that we need to also consider. So starting with this topic of unemployment, the first myth I'm going to uh, bring out there is unemployment is a major issue for rural African youth. I heard some of you said uh, unemployment in the chat, and I think it's something that we all hear very often. Now, first of all, I have to say, actually, this is not quite true. Youth unemployment is the lowest in rural sub-Saharan Africa compared to urban areas and any other developing region. So if you look at this graph, this is the summary of some findings of ILO School to Work Transition Service uh, over 25 countries. And the unemployment rate uh, for rural youth in Africa is lowest compared to any other. And you might be surprised to hear that, but actually the real problems that we see are, are, are slightly different. They're not just being unemployed, they're un underemployment, informality, low productivity, low wages and incomes. And bringing the, all of them together, maybe we can call it working poverty. What this means is that people actually are working. They're doing things to survive, of course, and as they have to in the absence of social protection. But actually that work is, of course, quite bad. Uh, and, and sometimes we say many rural Africans are in fact too poor to be unemployed. They cannot afford the luxury to go without any employment for a period, maybe to search for a better job or anything like that. So, I'm putting this out there, of course, to say, how do we need to address this? It's an important way of phrasing the problem. So can we say then if unemployment is not the main issue, is employment creation not important? Well, of course it is. Um, and then 
indeed, I would argue this one of the key issues in, in rural African context is a bit different from just saying people don't have jobs uh, or they, they are not employed. They are, but of course the working conditions are very bad and so on and so forth and the incomes are very low. But the main reason for rural poverty and these issues that I just highlighted is actually quite simple. And then I would argue this is the case across the board. And that is that labor demand is lower than the labor supply. That means there are not enough jobs out there for the people who are seeking those jobs. You know, too few jobs for too many people, very frankly put. And when I say employment, by the way, that does not just include formal jobs, wage jobs. It also just as much uh, includes jobs as being an entrepreneur, uh, having a business and so on. That equally is part of employment in, in both formal and informal. By the way. So in order to address this, again, if the labor demand is low, the labor supply is very high, too many people for not enough jobs, what we basically need to do, it's a simple equation, we need to tighten the labor market. We need to reduce the gap between the supply and the demand. And there are two very simple reasons to do this. On the one hand, we need to reduce the labor supply or we need to increase the labor demand. So it's, it's in that sense, very straightforward. Now you might ask, but, so I want to go through this one by one. Uh, you might say, so reducing the labor supply, doesn't this happen automatically? Because of one, we hear a lot about rural urban migration. And we hear, hear a lot about the rapidly aging uh, rural African population. And maybe you're familiar with these arguments. Which brings me to the next myth. Rural populations in Africa, the rural population is aging rapidly. Or you might have heard a different way of putting this. This has been a quote that, that or something, a, a, a statistic that has been propagated quite widely. The average age of the African farmer is 60. So, who of, the, who of you might have heard this? I will move straight forward, but uh, I think a lot of you might have heard it if you work in the rural development discourse, especially in Africa. Uh, this is something that is quite widely spread. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Uh, if we compare the different uh, regions and especially look at the red lines here in these graphs between Asia, Africa, and Latin America, you see that the red line, those who are older than 65, in rural areas is the flattest, it's hardly rising. Uh, and on the other hand, the, the youth are going down much less. So, so that gap, so that aging of the population is much slower in Africa compared to the other regions. And in fact, we do know, of course, that there's still high population growth and a large cohort of youth, young, young people coming into the labor market and, 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 and adding to the population every year. In addition to that, of course, we know that life expectancy, unfortunately, in Africa is quite low. And, and this statistic of the African farmer is 60 doesn't quite stack up. So this, this myth of about the, the aging population and the old farmers in Africa, it's not quite so straightforward. And I don't, I, I think it's actually overhyped and might not even be true at all. Then the other thing that people are often concerned about is the rural to urban migration. Uh, and that is a major concern. It's a very common, and, and, and you hear about it often. And let me give you a couple of quotes. Uh, the first one is, address African rural youth employment now or they will migrate. This almost sounds like a threat, doesn't it? And that is something that's, that uh, came from an AU-EU meeting in 2017. And this is a direct quote from that meeting. Another one here uh, from, from a report from the FAO, making agriculture more attractive to young farmers and creating decent employment opportunities in rural areas could reverse migration of youth to urban centers abroad. So this is a very central concern, it seems, when we talk about rural development, as if that is almost one of the main motivations that we want to reduce that urban migration, rural to urban migration. Now, I'm not a uh, specialist in migration issues and so on, but, but I I did look into it a little bit. And I, I have to wonder, are these concerns, first of all, very valid? And is it really how we should frame the problem? Is it, should it really be one of our key concerns? Now, first of all, some literature, and I can't go into much detail here, but some literature actually suggests that urbanization in Africa is slower if you compare it to other regions, particularly in Asia, where you know of the booming huge um, metropolitan areas uh, that, that, that 
grow even faster than what we say in many uh, African urban centers. But then beyond that, we need to acknowledge that migration actively contributes to economic development and even structural transformation. That means migration is closely linked with economic upward mobility. This graph is very slow here, uh, small here, sorry, but, but you see the argument a bit in more detail in the, in the article. It basically is a study that quite clearly shows that looking, looking at people uh, 10 years ago and then 10 years later, uh, uh, and then comparing those who have migrated or not and how they have compared, how they have improved in their livelihoods and so on. And consistently you see that those who have moved and those moved even further into urban areas and so on uh, from a study in rural Tanzania, they have actually benefited the most. And I think this also ultimately uh, uh, coincides with our instincts. Of course, that's the reason why people move. They want to better their lives. And then I think we all know that. So maybe rather than worrying about the overflowing cities, should we not actually be more concerned about the infrastructure? And I heard infrastructure in the text in the in the text box or the chat box mentioned earlier that we need to ensure that the conditions are there that those people can actually move into the cities and promote that development, contribute to that development, rather than seeing it as a threat. Now moving on. So again, I said we need to either reduce the labor supply or increase the labor demand. In that regard, looking at the supply side, that is something that is still very difficult to do because we know that in Africa, population growth is still very high. There are some ways of doing that. Education is very important, making sure that uh, children stay in schools as long as possible, elimin eliminating child labor, but also maybe uh, helping elderly to not have to work as long as they must buy by giving them access to pensions so on can be important contributors. But much more importantly, increasing the labor demand, that really is where we can really influence job creation overall, but particularly in rural areas. And that means we need to find ways of creating jobs and productive jobs and ideally decent jobs. So how can we achieve this? This is where I want to hear from you. What do you think? How can we best promote youth employment in, in rural Africa? So here I would like to ask Lisa to do the poll. I would like, there's a poll on your screen um, where I would ask you to, to click up to three uh, of the answers. They are incentivize, promote careers in agriculture or in services or in manufacturing. Do you think enhancing skills for rural youth is important? Increasing smallholder farmers productivity something like a green revolution, it's sometimes called, maybe public employment or public works programs, improving access to land and capital, uh, develop non-agricultural value chains, promote entrepreneurship, self-employment and business skills to eliminate child labor or any other. So please click on the poll, click the, the three most important answers as you see them on how we can best promote youth employment in rural Africa. I'll give you a minute and then I hope we can see the results. And Lisa, please let me know how it's going, how many answers we have. How's it looking? Thirty of thirty-nine. I think then please show the results. All right. Thank you very much. So I hope everyone can see this. Improve access to land and capital is the first foremost answer, and enhancing the skills for rural youth. Very interesting. Develop non-agricultural value chains, promoting entrepreneurship, uh, and incentivizing careers in agriculture. So those are the the main answers that I see here. So access to land skills, non-agriculture value chains, but then also entrepreneurship uh, and, and, and promoting careers in agriculture. Thank you very much. Now, very often we see that, and I'm going through, through a few more of these myths now to try and address that. Many of you focused on, well, you said agriculture, 
and the skills, I will go into that in a moment, improving access to land and capital, I assume, to pursue agricultural careers. But then I hear many people say, agriculture is unattractive to youth, isn't it? And I'm sure you must have heard this very commonly. This is something we call the youth and agriculture problem. It's something that is very, com very commonly discussed when, when the issue of African agriculture is discussed. And almost in any discussion on the topic I've heard, I, heard, I, I, I would hear any constituent or anyone in the audience raise this. It is something that's extremely common. Something that is also sometimes called agriculture is not cool. Now, I want to address this a little bit because first and foremost, is this not a little disingenuous? Because why have none of us, or most of us, I assume at least, not chosen careers in, Af in, in agriculture? And the reason, of course, for that, I would argue, is smallholder agriculture or African agriculture in its majority is deeply associated with poverty, very unfortunately. So this is not something I'm condoning. <laughs> it is just stating almost an obvious fact because we know that, and that's why we're concerned about rural development because there's so much poverty. And that is because that, and there's a deep association with agriculture in that. Now, there's, this is structural, if I put it this way. If you look at these bars, this is the employ, this, uh, just in, in, in Africa, this is the share of employment in agriculture, and this is the share of GDP. What you immediately see is that many, many people work in agriculture in Africa, but they only get a very small share of the GDP out of it. Much more, smaller than industry, where very few people work, and also much smaller than, than uh, in services. But what this basically means is that many, many people have to share a much, much smaller share of the pie uh, in, in this key sector. So I would argue there's actually a clear misallocation of labor. There are too many Africans uh, in this low productivity agriculture. Now, of course, we need to improve the productivity and we need to find ways to do this. But basically, this shows that something needs to change. Something needs to give. We cannot assume that we still get we get a more productive form of agriculture and still have all these many people, around 60 to 70% of Africans, working in the sector. So as development occurs and agriculture becomes more commercialized, becomes more productive and so on, there is a clear argument to be made that other sectors will need to absorb this labor that will be released from that sector, uh, which is at the moment not productive enough. And then I would argue as we increase the productivity, it will not be able to sustain this, uh, this high number of workers. And it's something that, that, will, that will be very important when I come to the end of my argument. I will skip this fifth myth just for the sake of time. I'll leave it here for, for you to look at it later. It's about the, the nature of the labor markets in, 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 rural African, in rural Africa and that there are actually very few wage jobs. Um, this is also in my view, not true, but I can't go into detail. Let's, let me go to the final one before I try and wrap up my argument. Rural youth employment is best promoted through self-employment entrepreneurship. And I also saw that uh, being quite a uh, favorite answer in the poll. It's a common assumption, but unfortunately also here, I have to say it might rely on a few, mis a few fallacies or, or, or misinterpretations or wrong assumptions. First of all, what we found, most African youth probably do not actually want to be entrepreneurs. This is, uh, these are the results from the same school to work transition survey where we asked, who would you like to work for? So we asked African youth, who would you like to work for? First and foremost, the vast majority of these red bars, people said they want to work in the government or in the public sector. And the blue bars here, they, is, they said they want to work for themselves and the others are other types of wage jobs. So basically 10%, only slightly over 10% of urban males and generally otherwise less than 10% of, of, of African youth are saying that they actually want to work for themselves, that they want to be entrepreneurs, that they want to be self-employed. So first of all, we need to change. So if we want to promote entrepreneurship and self-employment, is this actually in the interest of, of many of these youth? Secondly, and this is maybe even a stronger argument, Fundamentally, we cannot create jobs uh, through this because they cannot create their own jobs. 
job creation is a function of economic demand. It means somebody needs to either sell their labor power or needs to sell their produ produce or, or their, 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 their services to someone. If we accept that demand is the main constraint in many of these economies, that there's not enough opportunity out there, either job opportunities or business opportunities, then entrepreneurship does not address this. So if the constraint is that it's low demand, even if we have a highly innovative entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneur they will still face a huge uphill struggle to come up with a business that can operate in such a very a constraint system, if you get what I mean. So this type of do-it-yourself employment creation is really quite difficult to achieve, especially for a large number of people. Of course, there will always be a few brilliant entrepreneurs and we look up to them and it's, it's inspiring what they do. But as a mass employment strategy, it doesn't work. And I would even argue it's unfair to many youth because it creates hope where, where the conditions are not right to, for that hope to be achieved. In them. So all this brings me to my, my main argument, which is the centra centrality of structural transformation when we talk about rural development. This is a very important graph. It shows how the, the labor force is um, changing as, a country, as, as countries develop. And these are countries uh, um, ordered by the uh, their per capita GDP. So on the left, you have the poorest countries, on the right, the richest country on a per capita GDP basis. And this is how the workers are distributed in these countries. And you see a very clear shift as you move from uh, poorer to richer nations. And that shift is basically this reduction of this purple area and this huge increase of the green area. The purple area are agricultural workers, which as development uh, occurs are becoming less and less and less structurally. And the green area are non-agricultural wage and salaried workers. So it is very clear that as development and, and, and growth unfolds, this has a remarkable shift in the labor market. And the ways of how people are working has to change in some way. So, and, and, and I think, I hope we agree that if we want to have a a developed rural Africa, we need to achieve this sort of structural transformation because of course it can't continue as it does right now. Now, but we cannot assume that as development happens, the current economics and social structures remain in place. There will be a change as ex exactly as seen in this, in this graph. So, and this of course requires very concerted policy action, quite a bit of leadership and vision in order to achieve this transition from from a few, mostly agrarian society, if I may say, to something that, that can create a sustainable, uh, 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 a decent living for everyone, both in rural and in urban areas. I give this example of the flower sector in, in Ethiopia as, a, as, a, as an example of how this can work in practice. I don't have time to go into this, but it's just an example where through very dedicated public policy, there can be a huge change in quite a few numbers of, number of years. And, then, and I think this is a good example of how we need to think about um, giving the right incentives to a particular sector, and I can't go into more detail for the lack of time, I'm sorry for this, uh, how, how very, in a very dedicated space, in a very short period of time, many jobs can be created by just focusing on the right sector and where there's a key, clear business opportunity. But this has been facilitated through very clear policy action. Now, I want to quickly link this to, to ILO's approach in this work, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically this is, and you can look at this later in a bit more detail, how ILO also tries to shape its rural development work and its support to rural development, rural employment in a particular fashion. And I think I want you to focus particularly on these three points, step up, step out, and step ahead, because it's sort of uh, brings across exactly what I've been saying. We need to look at these things in, in a structural manner and then and, and, and in a coherent manner, bringing them all together. Step up means, of course, in improving the agriculture that is being done, raising the pro productivity, raising the incomes of farmers and so on, which is incredibly important. But at the same time, we cannot assume that all of the people that are currently in agriculture will stay there. So we need to find ways 
for, for them to step out. That doesn't mean they need to step out of rural areas, but they probably need to step out of agriculture and for example, into agri-processing. So which is one, one form of manufacturing, of course, uh, into other uh, uh, non-agricultural activities that are of course very uh, possible and, and happen in rural areas. And the third one is to step ahead, which is so to speak to future proof this work to make sure that it's uh, sustainable, that it's uh, in tune with the climate and, and, and uh, uh, green economies, uh, that it is resp uh, responsive to the future of work as we at ILO call it and so on and so forth. Again, I think this is, this is just to exemplify how we are trying to structure, uh, to, to, to incorporate these sort of ideas in a way uh, that that makes sense. Another important way that, that ILO is supporting is what we call a new generation of national employment policies. I can't go into detail, but there's a slide at the very end uh, where you, if you're interested in this, can have a look at this. Let me try and wrap up, and I know I've been talking for too long, but I hope there's some interest in what I'm saying here. I know that I've been deliberately provocative or thought-provoking this uh, presentation. I said it before. But I think there's some important points that I'm trying to bring across. First of all, if we want to talk about rural development, I think we need to move away from solutions that are based on the individual, the individual being the job seeker, the farmer, the young person, the entrepreneur, the business, the skilled or the unskilled worker. But we need to move towards structural uh, interventions because ultimately these are structural pros, uh, uh, problems of, of a lack of demand, a lack of labor demand, a lack of jobs in the economy. And just by, for example, giving skills to someone, we don't create these jobs. So that's why I say skills development, entrepreneurship are important, but only if they are coupled with an increase in demand. And otherwise, they, they can be almost meaningless, if not even counterproductive, because then you create a lot of skills, you create a lot of entrepreneurship skills, but the demand is there, not there to catch these, to absorb these, and then you create aspirations that are unmet, which can be quite dangerous. Now, rural development in all of this, I maybe didn't emphasize it enough, but it is key. So we need to focus on rural areas, absolutely. But it must be through a process of structural transformation. It cannot simply be relying on the existing structures of smallholder productivity or trying to improve smallholder productivity. If we improve smallholder productivity, Almost by definition, it means that less people can be productively engaged in that in that sector, and so we need to also look at other other areas where they can find jobs. So we should expect that people will exit agriculture as development unfolds, and we need to find jobs for them. So we need to create these non-agricultural employment opportunities, uh, but at the same time, agriculture is important. Don't get me wrong; I'm not saying that agriculture isn't important, but it will shift in its form as development and, uh, unfolds and we need to anticipate and, and, and support that I think as our work as we as we do in our work as, as the development com community. So how do I suggest and I need to go very quickly here how do I suggest we can translate all of this into policy principles. First of all we need to reduce the disparity between labor supply and labor demand so set at the very beginning. So I gave some ideas here, but we need to stimulate labor demand, employment intensive investment and value chain development, sector policy, industrial uh, policies become very important. here. We need to promote structural transformation, but we also do that in a way that reduces its disruptive effects. I didn't go into this, but of course, all that I'm describing is not a smooth process. Some people are losing out, some people are losing their livelihoods, and we need to find ways how to manage that, how to catch them, how to enable them to find other uh, employment opportunities. This is where social dialogue really becomes important, where skills development becomes important, social protection, employment services, and so on and so forth. But first of all, we need to find ways to stimulate this structural transformation, which I believe is a core part of, of uh, the development. But I think it also means that too much focus just on smallholder farming can be counterproductive because it actually does not necessarily promote this type of tra structural transformation enough. We need to find this or nurture the synergies between rural and urban spaces. These are very much relying on each other. And I think a lot of the, the business opportunities, the value chain opportunities 
very much rely on that linkage between urban and rural economies, which, by the way, the, the urban economies, of course, include secondary and tertiary towns. We're not just talking about the capitals. And I think we need to find ways of doing that. And finally, maybe that's my most concrete idea to, to, to offer to you, so to speak. I think we need to think more clearly about rural labor markets and how we can support workers and labor markets there directly. Very often when we do our development projects, we think about farmers maybe, or business, uh, business owners. But do we actually think about how they access labor? How do they make sure, that, how do, are they enabled to maybe offer better conditions to casual wage workers on the farms? How do they uh, make sure that, how do workers, work seekers, casual, seasonal workers, how do they actually make sure that they find enough jobs? Can we give them more information? Uh, can we give them a better voice, a better representation, and so on and so forth? I think there's many innovative ways. I can't go into too much detail, but I, there are many innovative ways of how this can be done. And it's maybe an area that is quite uh, undersubscribed in our de rural development work. And maybe there's some ideas that we can do to actually stimulate this type of employment creation, to stimulate uh, labor markets in the rural sphere. I know I've been going a bit too long and I apologize, but I hope there was something in there of interest and, and this could trigger a nice discussion. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Bernd. I think that was really inspiring and I think a lot of food for thought. So I would just uh, directly pass over to Mauricio for the panel discussion. Thank you, Frank, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, colleagues. Wherever you are connected from, welcome to this panel conversation on perspectives for structural transformation and employment creation for rural youth. Now, as Frank said, this is Maurizio Navarra. I am the coordinator of the Secretariat of the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development, now hosted by IFAD, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. Now, we do have an amazing panel today with equally amazing speakers, each bringing a different perspective to follow up to the keynote we just listened to. Now, before we start, let's, let us set some basic ground rules for our conversation. These were already recalled by Frank, but let me recall them again. You do have a chat box in which you can post your questions and provide your thoughts. You're already doing this. So please continue using it. We will surely use our points to stimulate the debate and interact with our speakers. And please remember to send the messages in the chat box to panelists and attendees so that everybody can read them. This is a webinar. So if you're interested in intervening in the plenary, you need to let us know. Type your message in the chat box or raise your hand. We will give you the floor. Now, in terms of our session today, what are the key highlights here? What is this session all about? Now, rural youth employment is definitely a hot topic in the development agenda, especially for Africa, but also as a global issue at large. We have been hearing more and more frequently talking about youth bulge, the demographic dividend, youth employment as one of the root causes for migration and so on and so forth, even non-specialists like me. The interest of the international community towards youth employment in rural areas has translated over time into several initiatives and programs, such as the G20 Rural Youth Employment Initiative in 2017, the IFAD Rural Development Report in 2019, the G7 Framework on Decent Job Creation for Rural Youth in the Sahel, the African Development Bank Enabled Youth Program, and so on and so forth. So youth employment is definitely a high priority for the EU, for IFAD, for basically all bilateral and multilateral donors, as well as partner countries. But it is, however, still a relatively new topic for the rural development community. There are some key questions and considerations that are at the core of the debate on rural youth employment. First, where do all the jobs come from? We're talking about 20 to 25 million jobs per year. Do they come from on-farm activities, processing, services, trade? Secondly, how many of these jobs will be wage jobs and how many of them issue of self-employment? How far do young people see a future in agriculture? And thirdly, and finally, what are the right policies and approaches to promote more and better jobs? How can good practices be scaled to significantly address such challenge? Now, in addition to the questions that I've just mentioned, there are some issues that are at the core of the article presented by Bernd 
which was the object of the keynote address. So there is quite some consensus and alignment at the project level, for example, on agriculture productivity, value chain integration, access to resources and markets, entrepreneurship and startup promotion, job and business matching, youth networks, and so on and so forth. But this consensus also follows a kind of agreed narrative or myths, as Bern called them in his presentation, without that are not being backed up by robust evidence in most cases, as they are mostly project level success stories or anecdotal. To really solve the problem, a much more profound rural and structural transformation is needed, which requires very complex long term multi sectoral policy solutions without having a clear or agreed development model theory for this. Now, the ILO article presented by Bern tries to debunk these myths with empirical evidence and suggesting alternatives, more coherent and complex policy options. And this is the entry point which I would invite all panelists and participants to think about today. Now, let's turn to our panel, which, as you will see, is a great blend of different institutional perspectives. Let me ask my panelists to turn on the camera so that uh, uh, the participants can also see you. Let me give you a warm welcome to Mukulia Kennedy Ayason of the Africa Union Commission. Welcome, Mukulia Kennedy. Syriac Akizimana of the Young African Researchers in Agriculture Network, Yara. Ken Shawa of the International Labor Organization, ILO. And Jane Lowicki Zuka from USAID. Welcome to all of you. Warm welcome. So we will start with an introductory question for all, all our panelists to break the ice, and then we'll get back to you again, and then at the end, we'll wrap up with Bernd again to follow up to his uh, presentation. And again, remember to use the chat box to type in your questions or discussion point. We cannot repeat this uh, long enough. So we start with Mukulia Kennedy Ayason. Kennedy, you are a policy officer in the Africa Union Commission of the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Environment. Your particular area of focus is digital agriculture, youth and women, rural infrastructure and marketing, especially in the rural economy. Now, Kennedy, from a continental African Union perspective, what are the current trends in Africa? What are the most notable trends in Africa at member state level? And in more, more in general, what is the role of the African Union Commission in fostering employment creation for rapidly growing youth population in Africa? Over to you, Kennedy. Thank you so much, uh, moderator, and uh, all participants who are able to join us in this webinar. I would like to first uh, address the issue of youth employment as a very big concern that the African continent, and especially the African Union, has taken note of. And you can know that the African Union Commission acknowledges that youth employment itself is a daunting development challenge that they feel they should consider. And that's why there are various continental frameworks that have been developed in order to address the issues of youth unemployment. And of specific concern that I would like to address is the issues that were addressed in Agenda 2063 for the Africa that we aspire to achieve equal opportunity of the continent. And that is based on sustainable and inclusive growth. This is also driven by potentials of its people, especially the youth and the women. Furthermore, you can also, uh, bear with me that integrating youth in agriculture and agribusiness is a very key priority in the implementation of the sustainable, uh, comprehensive African Agriculture Development Plan, which we call CADAP, and its momentum result work that is from 2020 to, I mean, 2014 to 2024. Likewise, uh, the Malabo Declaration on Accelerated Growth and Transformation for Shared Prosperity and Improved Livelihoods endorsed. Uh, by the African Union Commission in 2014, identify specific youth-related uh, commitments. And this includes the commitment to have uh, poverty by 2025 through what we call the inclusive and growth transformation. And specifically to create jobs for at least 30% of the continental youth. And number two is also to sup support what we call a preferential entry of youth and women into employment and its participation. We have other frameworks such as the business plan for the implementation of CADAP that is basically addressing the issues of youth. Then we have uh, what we call the agribusiness strategy, which is the continental strategy. This also addresses the issue of the youth. 
We have what we call the action plan for youth empowerment, which is very much a concern with the issue of youth. We have the AU five-year program that is aimed at addressing the issue of, especially when you look at priority area number uh, 80, which concerns income jobs and decent work priority. This has been what the commission has been doing in order to address the issue of youth employment. The 1 million by 2021 initiative that is aimed at providing at least 1 million youth of African with opportunities in education, entrepreneurship, employment and engagement by 2021 is also one, despite the impact of COVID-19, this has been uh, what is it. And again, the TVET continental uh, strategy, which, will, which is aimed at providing a vocational training in order to encourage youth employment. As at the moment, as per your question, what is the current trend? There is mixed trends as far as the continent is concerned, looking at the issues of youth employment. This is simply because our countries are not at the same path. And that's why the AUC is providing policy guidance, advice, and facilitating policy dialogues to our member states, especially in the food systems, to encourage what we call uh, employment of the youth. The AUC is also developing what we call it the dedicated strategies that will support youth engagement, especially in the agriculture sector. And uh, this is going to be done through the agribusiness strategy. For instance, we are developing what we call the African, agri African agribusiness youth strategy. This is one of the things. And we're also promoting what we call a policy coherence between youth employment and migration, because this is one of an important aspect this day that is happening, to making sure that we develop the rural economy. And once the rural economy is developed, the African youth will not bother their lives to cross the Mediterranean Sea seeking better jobs in Europe and where it is very hard. And I, I can give an example of countries in the continent which are doing very well. Example is the Cavat which is actually having policies several in terms of youth employment. It has also dedicated at least enough of its budget for, for education, which, is, which stands at around 16.4% in order to improve the youth. Countries like Kenya also have got what we call the national youth policy, which visualizes a society that have got an equal opportunities as its citizen in order to promote the youth. The strategic plan of the Kenya, which is 2020-2024, has mandated actual a youth development in its policies and program, which is placed under the office of the president. And then there's also what we call uh, the, the youth, I mean, the youth empowerment service, which were listed under the devolution and planning, which is sits under the office of the president of the Republic of Kenya. These are basic um, areas where we can see that the continent has mixed. So when you go far north, you find that in the north, employment of youth is very relative, similar to when you come to the central part of the continent. And the worst part of it is in the southern part of the continent. I thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kennedy. So a great deal of, uh, of instruments, tools, uh, policy instruments uh, all across the continent. Thank you for giving uh, such a good uh, conversation starter. Let's now turn to Syriac Hakizimana. Now, Syriac, you are a researcher and PhD candidate in the Institute for Poverty, Land, and Gregarian Studies at the University of Western Cape in South Africa. You are currently leading the Southern Africa Regional Hub of the Agricultural Policy Research in Africa program, which aims to produce new information and insights into different pathways to agricultural commercialization. And you are coordinating the Young Agriculture Researchers in Agriculture Network, or YARA, a network that brings together young and early career African researchers in agriculture from all over the continent. Now, since we, you are here with us from a research perspective, what policies and programs can work best in transforming agriculture and making rural economies attractive to youth? Over to you, Syriac. Thank you so much, uh, Mauricio, and the greetings to all my fellow panelists and the participants in this uh, important conversation. Now, this question that Mauricio that you are putting forward really uh, underscores the utmost importance of the argument that Bernard uh, developed in his presentation, which is the agent you need to rethink and engage quite strategically with the idea of a structural transformation in the context of African transformation that has been around since the 1950s, really. Bernard has presented one way of thinking uh, about the structural transformation that emphasized, I might say, the, change, the changing relationship between agriculture and the urban industry. However, 
in the context of one, uh, stagnating development of urban industrialization in the post-colonial Africa. Two, high global food prices combined with the rising domestic food demand driven by the rapid urbanization in Africa uh, with the value of Africa, Africa's food markets expected to rise from 313 billion uh, US dollars in 2010 to 1 trillion uh, US dollars in 2030, uh, according uh, to a World Bank report that was published in 2013. And uh, three, the nature of the demographic transition across the continent that uh, Bennett has uh, touched on. I do think that uh, we should really pay particular attention to the idea of the so-called African type of structural transformation uh, driven by agriculture, not urban industry, as argued by uh, Firma and his colleague uh, at the World Bank in 2014. Then the key question around that uh, it becomes how to, operation, to operationalize such a process of development along a much more balanced growth path in developing the policies and the programs that can work best in transforming agriculture and making rural economies attractive to youth. Uh, Chairperson, uh, because of time constraint, I've got a lot of ideas around how to go about it, but because of the, uh, you know, the time constraint, let me highlight three points only which are articulated around the interlinked relationship between land, labor, capital, and the market. Number one, land tenure regime in most African countries are skewed against the youth. I would like to submit chairperson that the reconfiguration of land ownership across the African continent needs to be undertaken with ownership by the youth uh, being, prioritized, be, being prioritized. Closely related to this are agrarian reforms, which need to be undertaken, which go beyond the issues of land tenure, but also seek to, uh, to address land use and the production constraint. Hence, I would argue, Chairperson, that land and agrarian policies and the programs across the African continent need to be reconfigured to ensure, uh, to ensure that the youth interests are, uh, are, are centered for, a, 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 you know, for the, um, to address the critical issues on patents and the trends of farmland ownership and access as, uh, um, uh, and access as well as farm sizes and the labor regime. Number two, modes of land transfer between generation. Number three, access to land and the credit. Number four, development of knowledge, network, and the skills. Let me move it to point number two that I wanted to highlight in really rethinking and the re reconceptualizing this uh, kind of uh, uh, structural transformation that we, we, we think is more conducive for African context. The policy and the programs needed to be geared towards established, uh, establishing um, functional or improving already existing agro and the related value chain. From this angle, Chairperson, I would like to submit that agripreneurship, which is land-based, but also incorporate other income generating strategies such as off-farm employment and the multiple business holdings need to be encouraged and supported. This has to be linked to the kind of to the kind of pathways of agricultural commercialization, which will not only show a practical benefit, but also help to display the notion that land-based livelihoods are most are mostly subsistence and are for other person, as Bernard has argued in his presentation. Finally, uh, Chairperson, let me make my final uh, point um, before you 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 you. You cut me. Uh, I'm afraid of being cut um, uh, Policies and the program uh, should emphasize investment in the market 
and informational connectivity. Chairperson, uh, the technological evolution and the transformation which has been witnessed in recent years as the world is transitioning to a fourth industrial revolution needs to be harnessed and incorporated in those policies and the programs. The youth can live and participate in the rural economy using the latest technological developments of which many have an interest in or have the requisite training. Rural young people can then leverage from the benefits that can be accrued from the fourth industrial revolution, which includes, among other things, chairperson, the use of advanced technologies, algorithms, large data sets, advanced software, and the connection to distant global markets. On that point, I rest my case, chairperson. Thanks, Syriac. And uh, yes, you were a little bit on the long side, but uh, what you were saying was uh, very interesting. So I would have never got your intervention. So thanks very much for, for the very pragmatic and, uh, and hands-on uh, responses that you provided to the question. Let me turn to Ken, Ken Shawa from the International Labour Organization. Ken, good afternoon. You are a senior economist at the ILO's Regional Office for Africa in Abidjan, in Côte d'Ivoire and a member of the ILO's research department, where you support the development and implementation of policy frameworks. You lead the work on future of work and coordinate regional research for the Africa region. Now, you are here, of course, with a labor market perspective. How conducive, you think, is the current policy framework for youth employment creation in your work? What can you tell, about, what can you tell us about this? What should be the role of agriculture and national employment strategies? Over to you, Ken, thanks, and please, Let's remember to be concise to also allow all the panelists to have uh, space uh, to talk. Thanks. Thanks, you, uh, Maurizio. I'll be concise, uh, but let me just thank my colleague uh, Ben Muller, who is always fantastic and uh, very passionate uh, to presenting such topics. He has done this many more times, and he will continue doing that. Um, yeah, so the first thing I want to start is to borrow his argument, and really just to emphasize that uh, given the statistics in, uh, in Africa, that uh, the informality rate is at 82.9%, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which has 85%, uh, the developing world, which has 96.8% uh, of the youth being affected by informality, we must do something. And I think for me, the policy incentiveness, or the, uh, to make sure that the policies are conducive, we must first of all deal with that. We must ensure that uh, we deal with the working poverty, we deal with the underemployment, we deal with the issues that it affect the social economic fabric uh, of the youth of the region. Uh, and then I want to move uh, to, uh, uh, again, what uh, my colleague alluded to. The idea that uh, we must make sure that demand is stimulated that we have a labor demand that can support uh, an equilibrium with a labor supply, that we do not uh, allow policies to just create the labor supply through, of course, you know, overskilling uh, without looking at the other side of the story, uh, which is to see whether we are able to actually absorb this labor, uh, you know, this labor supply. And for me, so it, the policy should be in such a way that it leads us towards some equilibrium in which we have players in the economic uh, in the economy that can actually benefit, I know, from the system. So I'm looking here at uh, um, issues that deal with uh, investment, promoting investment so that we can promote jobs. This could be domestic investment. This could be foreign, you know, investment, foreign direct investment, if you like. But we must make sure that as we promote this investment, the public investment should only crowd in the private investment. In other words, there should be complementarity between public investment and private investment, just to be sure that we create that demand. Stimulating a demand for an economy means that we should put in something there. We should, uh, you know, invest uh, in important sectors in that, uh, you know, economy. Uh, I also think that uh, because 60 to 80 percent 
of our countries are actually rural, if you like. 60%, 80% of the people live in the rural areas. I come from Malawi. I uh, stayed, uh, you know, a greater part of my life in a rural area. So I'm dealing with a topic that I understand very well. Uh, then we must have deliberate policies that actually target the rural population. Now, targeting the rural population does not necessarily mean that we should create or encourage a dichotomy uh, of those who are in the urban sector and those who are in the rural area. We should make sure that we bridge the gap and make sure that there is an incentive for people to stay in the rural areas. Digitalization is not, for example, something that should only be for the urban areas. We should make sure that we digitalize our rural areas. We should make sure that uh, we put the, the, the right or the relevant appropriate technologies that can allow digitalization. We have seen the pandemic uh, uh, because we have neglected the rural areas in terms of the right infrastructure for digitalization, they have suffered. They have not been going to school because they cannot uh, you know, do online work, uh, you know, as opposed to those probably who are in the urban sectors. We must deliberately target the rural sector. Um, uh, the other thing that I want to agree with Bern is that we have got to take a sector approach. We've got to look at sectors that can employ people, that can employ our youth, uh, but those sectors should be that can also be uh, you know, more productive. You know, we need to increase productivity as well as increasing the quantity of the people that want to, you know, to work. So we, we must do that. Um, uh, and um, the, the other one that uh, would be uh, the last one probably is that our macro policies should be deliberate. We have seen countries where they have deliberately incentivized industries to ensure that uh, this industry should employ the young, young women and, and, and men, and then they give them a tax holiday for some period of time, just to incentivize them to be able to employ this. And uh, uh, on, on the issue of agriculture, yes, agriculture still employs more than 50% of the people. It's the greatest employer. It's the greatest employing sector in Africa. And we have seen, uh, you know, uh, Maurizio, that uh, in the COVID situation, we have been seeing a migration that has been the opposite. People living in the urban areas going to the rural. Why? Because agriculture now becomes the last you know, uh, you know, the last result, it becomes a, a contingent, uh, a contingency that, uh, you know, helps people to actually, you know, uh, you know, move out of the, the pandemic. So it is a very, very important sector. But why, what should we do to it? Industrialize it. What should we do to it? Commercialize it. What should we do to it? Ensure that we develop value chains that create jobs through, of course, uh, the important backward and forward, you know, linkages. What should we do, lastly, is that uh, we should encourage and support the continental programs that support agriculture. Uh, my colleagues have mentioned here the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program. Let us support it. Let us see how youth employment can fit into the African free uh, continental trade area. Let us make sure that we utilize the programs that are there to ensure and enhance youth employment. Over to you, Maurizio. Thanks very much, Ken, and thanks uh, for, for this very inspiring uh, intervention. I like this uh, idea that you put on the table of deliberate uh, uh, policy reforms. That's, I think, the, the key message that, uh, that should emerge from your intervention. Thank you very much. Let me turn to uh, Jane, Jane uh, Lowicki Zuka from the USAID. Jane, you serve as a senior youth advisor within USAID's Bureau for uh, Resilience and Food Security where you work to strengthen the agency's effort to engage youth in agricultural-led growth, nutrition, resilience and water security, sanitation and hygiene activities. Now you clearly bring here the donor perspective. From a donor or program perspective, how do, does USAID fit within this discourse related to youth employment? What priority does rural youth employment have in your organization? And from a program implementation point of view, what are the best practices you identified already? Thanks, Jane. Over to you. Pleasure, and thanks so much for the opportunity to be here with all of you today. Thanks to the ILO, Dr. Muller, for the report and article, to all the panelists and uh, participants. You're, you've gotten me all fired up already to talk about um, youth employment, and I hope I can speak to at least a little of the nuance that uh, you mentioned is so pertinent here. So as a donor agency, USAID works with partner countries and their communities to help them achieve their development objectives. So 
We do this with our own corresponding vision of achieving a resilient and prosperous world for all, and where that for all part very much includes youth. And this sort of kicks off some initial comments that might seem quite obvious, but are very fundamental, I think, about what we're learning about working with young people in food systems. Um, and for starters, you know, we've got to believe in youth and their capabilities and their current and future potential. And if that belief isn't there, it's very difficult to progress anywhere. We also know that we need to do our best to understand youth and engage them in all of their diversity. So USAID aims to take a positive youth development approach, no matter what sector we're working in, and to integrate approaches with young people that do seek to build skills, assets, and competencies, foster healthy relationships, strengthen the environment, and transform systems. So we do see young people as key contributors, but also as needing to benefit from food systems. And that's a very important lens in going into any of the work that we do. So in countries that are still undergoing structural transformation, where there are uh, you know, a large population, a portion of the population is still engaged in agriculture, we do know that youth are at the heart of the challenge to increase agricultural productivity and to transform sustainable food systems, including to mitigate and adapt to the impacts of climate change, which stand to affect young people for the longest period of time. It's also critically important to ensure that young people reap benefits from engagement in food systems. For example, as we're talking about today, to access better jobs that are more lucrative, safe and stable, and um, by being able to access and afford and consume highly nutritious foods. So strong internal mandates matter a lot. USAID already has strong policy mandates for working with partner governments to create more and better job opportunities for youth, including in food systems. So for example, we have an employment framework, the global food security strategy, the economic growth policy, all of which do emphasize inclusive and sustainable economic growth and the need to create opportunities for youth. The economic growth policy advances enterprise-driven development and recognizes that firm level productivity drives economic growth. So where diverse commercial enterprises that include firms and farms of all sizes and all sectors, formal and informal, for-profit and nonprofit, drive the development process through investment and innovation. But the EG policy also recognizes that the benefits of economic growth must be equitable and sustainable and prioritizes inclusion, sustainability, and resilience to ensure that programs have clear benefits for the economically poor and marginalized groups and also ensure environmental sustainability. So turning to practice, through USAID's Feed the Future initiative and many other activities, the United States has made a wide variety of investments working with partners to strengthen youth involvement in food system. And a typical theory of change involved with that has, in, has been to fund activities that ensure youth are equipped with appropriate skills, that they have the economic assets that they need to engage, and that they also have a strong supporting enabling environment. And obviously that's quite broad, that's a big spectrum. And these activities have really run the gamut from developing youth entrepreneurship to productivity enhancement. Um, and the, the approaches have been a combination of being very youth targeted and uh, also youth inclusive. So some key top line reflections on some of this are that intentionality matters. Um, our policy frameworks have provided the needed mandates for stepped up action by USAID with partner governments in prioritizing young people. So throughout our program cycles, that means taking deliberate steps and adding accountability that involves a focus on youth, gender, heterogeneity within populations um, to ensure targeted action. We also know to start where youth are and one size does not fit all. So structural transformation that we're talking about takes time. Um, young people are only young once and they don't have a lot of time to wait around for all of the structural transformation that is envisioned. So while we do focus on investments that will shape the future of work, 
or including formal employment, you know, diagnosing and analyzing opportunities for young people in specific contexts, often in very local markets, including on-farm, off-farm, and non-farm opportunities is really key to unlocking better near-term opportunities that can also drive downstream creation of better jobs. So the article's focus on you know, the informal wage jobs is a key insight to pursue there, which was a really interesting portion of that article. Another key learning is that for sure we know, I hope we know collectively that you cannot train a, a youth into a job that doesn't exist, right? So we all agree that high quality formal education opportunities are always fundamentally important, but we've also been learning that as economies transform, um, education systems need to catch up. And then in the meantime, we do need much more diversification of the types of education products and services available to young people, whether it's through digital technologies, but also we see some interesting um, emerging models of private sector driven pluralistic extension and advisory services that do engage young people as providers and recipients to fill some of the education gap um, and, and offer more near-term opportunities at greater scale to uh, jumpstart young people's ability to engage in markets actively and benefit from them, including to develop and build transferable skills. And a, a few more things. Um, you know, we do emphasize systems change um, and we do see some emerging uh, learning on gender and youth inclusive market systems development. And we do see that they hold some potential for more uh, sustainable impacts with young people at scale. But much more experience is needed on the youth focus side in particular. Most of these um, are pursuing the win-win opportunities with private sector businesses, which are a hallmark of these approaches. Um, and I think one of the areas to pursue is how we are balancing both high and low intensity facilitation approaches, uh, addressing different types of market constraints. Um, again, looking at very specific contexts and local markets and including a special emphasis on SMEs as key uh, job creators also addressing and anticipating any negative intended, unintended consequences as markets shift. We do focus, uh, our, I think also our focus on gender and women often um, does not sufficiently account for female youth. So I do think we have a lot to do to close the gap for how we address sort of age and gender related issues at the same time. Um, and our evidence also is still limited on whether, you know, what we're investing in is actually creating jobs or is shifting jobs, uh, shifting people into different existing jobs. So we want to learn more about uh, how we do that with youth participation. Um, and part of that is also about funding opportunities to strengthen youth voice and engagement in uh, policy systems processes. And last but not least, we know that integrated programming is needed to accelerate progress. Um, we see that success with young people in economic inclusion often uh, requires integration with other approaches, for example, wraparound uh, services. Um, and you know, we need to work more deliberately as USAID and with other donors and stakeholders to unlock the potential of more and better job creation by better integration of different types of programming, but even beyond that, to think across different donors and different stakeholders in any given context about how we're synergizing and maximizing our impacts together um, to answer some of those bigger questions together as to whether we're looking at the same time at the structural transformation and um, you know, lots of opportunities that do exist at micro levels and, and in the interim. So are we thinking big enough and, and, and enough about our collective impact? And I think we can do more in this decade uh, of action towards 2030. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks to you, Jen. And actually, you, you started answering my second round of question already on, on integration, which I really appreciate because it's a very good conversation start on that. So if you all agree, I propose to, to do the following. I, I you know, understood and, and read all and uh, listened to all these uh, 
interventions uh, from the panel. No, we we really uh, understand the need for targeted policies, policies that need to be deliberate, that need to modernize the agricultural sector and beyond. They need to, you know, dwell on structural transformation. They need to be transformative. They need to respond to clear, very clear policy mandates. And then the importance to have country-led strategies, but that they are harmonized at the regional levels. And then I also heard a lot the importance of commercialization, uh, a commercialization but needs, that needs to prioritize inclusion, resilience, and sustainability. And last but not least, the need for better coordination and integration. So if you all agree, I'll get back to the panel once again with a very short question, which will deserve a very short answer. So the question is very clear. What, we, what can we do more and differently together? What kind of joint action going beyond silos to improve our collaboration as a stakeholder community, not only as donor community, but as a stakeholder community, including with partnership platforms such as the Global Donor Platform? And then also, how do we look at policy processes like the Food System Summit to improve our coordination? Now, I'd like to get back to each and every panelist and give you only one minute to respond to this question. And then we'll get back to Bernd again with a few questions from the attendees. Yes, Bernd, we haven't finished with you yet. Uh, so once again, uh, the question, what can we do more and differently together? Mukulia, Kennedy, Ayason, please, one minute to respond to this question. Thank you so much. I think what uh, we need to do right now is for us to get more focused and engaged. It means that as for us in the commission, we should now be able to kind of uh, uh, decentralize our system of work, our system of policy making, to making sure that it is a, a bottom up approach other than the up down approach that we have been using at almost all time so that we get what is done at the community level or at the country's uh, member states level. And then we now go on to develop policies that responds to the issue of youth. Thank you. That's a fantastic answer. Very clear message here. Decentralization of, of decision layers. Very good. Syriac, one minute for you also to respond to the question. Thank you, Mauricio. I'll be very quick. Uh, I would imagine that uh, Mauricio, uh, a platform like this one really provides a kind of fertile ground uh, for cross fertilization of expertise and experiences and the ideas. And they, they're adopting a much more integrative approach on how we can really harness such strength from different angles, from different contexts, from different perspectives that can play a critical role to designing a much coherent and efficient policy that they can address issues that we are, we are grappling with. Thank you. Fantastic, Syriac. Thanks very much. I really appreciate how concise and clear your answers are in this, in this second round. Ken, Ken Shower from the ILO. One minute also for you. Maurizio, to achieve structural transformation, which we all need, we must work together to increase the number of member states with specific and important measures for decent work in the rural areas. Dialogue is already doing this. Let us work together to ensure that we have important measures that target the rural areas. As regards the food summit that is coming up, that is upcoming, Dialogue is already engaging the employers' organizations, engaging the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the governments, basically engaging the um, workers' organizations and engaging every stakeholder to be sure that uh, we benefit uh, from this summit and that we make a good contribution to the summit itself. I think that together we can work together, share notes on what we're already doing to be sure that uh, we participate fully, we coordinate fully, and we uh, establish that coherence that is necessary. Thanks, Maurizio. Thanks to you, Ken. And now, uh, last but not least, over to you, Jane. What uh, can you tell? You have already started answering in your, in your intervention. That's true. Oh. I, I took too much time. So in my 30-second element, I'll focus on the Food System Summit. I do think it's an excellent opportunity for um, amplifying our collective actions over the and making a commitment to, towards 2030 
to set some targets that are very ambitious and work um, to build on commitments we've already made and strengthen the way that we are coordinating research, uh, our resources towards tackling both the structural change opportunities and also um, near-term opportunities in markets with young people. Thanks a lot, Jane, and thanks to all the panelists for the very, very uh, good uh, interventions and inspiring, uh, and inspiring words. Now, looking at the questions you have typed in the chat box, there are several things actually that were asked and, and some questions have already been answered in the, in the chat box by the panelists. For example, there was a question by uh, OECD on the role of CADEV, the political will is there, but still more work needs to be done with regards to CADEV, uh, for instance. Uh, there's, there's a question related to data, data uh, that are existing to, to you know, take uh, uh, decision make for decision making and policy making. That is also been uh, uh, um, uh, answered in the in the chat box. Um, yes, there is a, another question actually that I think would deserve some conversation. Also from OECD, from uh, Gian Rin, how does ILO employment program address, address international trade impact? on commodity prices and commodity specialization. Would uh, Ken or Bern maybe can take this question? One of you two. Bernd, would you like to do it? Ken, do you want? I can. Uh, yeah, Ben, you can go ahead. You can go ahead, Maggie. Sure. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, that is a good question. And I mean, I, first of all, foremost, ILO is not a trade organization. So those are not our main constituents. And of course, that that makes it inherently more difficult. But we are partnering up um, uh, with, with UNCTAD, for example, and, and, and the, uh, the World Trade Organization to particularly make sure that, for example, international labor standards and issues of job creation are in integrated in trade agreements. So I think that's a very important element where, where we can make sure that, that trade has a better employment or, or labor impact. Actually, uh, thinking of Jane, they're very, very crucial, for example, also in that process is AGOA, which is, of course, the, the American uh, pre preferential trade access, uh, access for, for I forgot the, the, the name of the acronym, but, uh, but it, it essentially is, is, is a trade agreement where African countries get pre preferential access to the, to the US market. And there, actually, that is hinged on the implementation of labor standards. So there were processes where for example, employers or workers or organizations have made complaints to the ILO that a certain government or a certain context in a particular country, I won't name examples here, but there are clear examples where, 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 where there have been complaints and then, and, and, and then there have been breaches of labor market uh, uh, um, um, provisions. And as a result of those complaints and the, the negotiations around that, the AGOA status was declined or was reversed or was, was, was um, um, suspended for a while. That put in pre intense pressure actually on the governments to increase their, their, their performance in terms of labor outcomes and then they got access to the market and as AGOA status was reinstated. So, so these are closely integrated. I could also talk about the Africa continental free trade area where we are or agreement where we're also trying to make sure that that is being contextualized much more in the sense of, of job creation and so on, and we're working with the AU there very concretely. Uh, I could go into more detail, but just to give you a, a, a snippet. Colleagues and panelists, unfortunately, I, I see from my clock that we're really, really running out of time, and, and, and actually time flew quite fast in the panel conversation. Now, if Frank allows me, I will, I will try to ask the panel another question. And then we'll revert to Bern, if you allow me to take a little bit more time of what I've been allocated. And actually, it's a question that Frank posted in the chat. Every job is needed, both on farm and off farm as well in other sectors. So the question is how to combine both and promote broad-based structural transformation. Who would like to take this question? Would Kennedy, for example, would you like to, to take this one or maybe Ken or anybody else? You repeat the question. I've not seen it well in the chat. Yes, every job is needed, both on farm, off farm, as well in other sectors. So the question is how to combine both and promote broad-based structural transformation. 
Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as uh, right now, we have actually a fully pledged uh, division that deals with the rural economy. So we need to make sure that we develop frameworks that improve the rural economy. For reason, we are in the process of developing what we call the rural infrastructure framework. This is aimed at providing services that are found uh, in the urban centers like electricity, better roads, um, telephone, uh, telephone lines, um, electricity that will help the, 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 the small scale industries to enable to turn out what we call the raw products into finished product. Value addition is what we are advoc advocating for. And this is all aimed at trying to now transform the rural uh, uh, economy into a better place that everybody will get job and work in. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Kennedy. Yes, Bernd, of course, you can you can also chip in the, this question. I saw your hand at the beginning and then Ken also would like to intervene. Thanks. I, I wanted to come in onto this question because I think it's crucial and maybe it, it is a way where my presentation could be slightly misperceived. My presentation was not to say agriculture is not important or we should disregard it or anything or that indeed we should have a trade off between industry uh, in favor of industry and against agriculture, anything of that sort, not at all. So, so for sure, and, and by, the, by, by that token, I actually wanted to highlight that I particularly uh, uh, appreciated Syriac's comments, and I agree a lot with them. I don't think there was a lot of uh, contradiction at all, in fact. And, and, and we need to focus on those productive farmers, on those emerging farmers, those who have the potential to become from more productive and need to support them. But that still means and, and that is my main issue here, so to speak, is that there are still many, many unproductive farmers and we need to find a solution for them too. And most likely that solution cannot just be in agriculture. Maybe some of them can become wage workers, they can, they can maybe work in food processing also, but not all of them. We need to look at them, but these go hand in hand. And then actually a Syriac point was also very important that we need a very productive, commercialized, uh, dynamic agriculture sector to feed those people who are no longer in agriculture if structural transformation occurs. So there needs to be th this point of agriculture driven structural transformation is highly important. But, and that is my big but here, all of this doesn't happen if we also don't have some form of sector policy, industrial policy. Find those sectors and value chains that will be very different from one country to the other, by the way. Find those where the opportunities are for job to uh, creation uh, where you can get a large number of jobs for especially youth that are, that are coming up in the African market. Thanks very much, Bernd. Ken, would you like to chip in with your with a very short uh, intervention? Thanks, Frank Maurizio. is giving me really, really hard looks. I need to close this session. Thanks, Maurizio. Both on and off farm employment is important. Um, the, the issue of uh, on-farm employment here was because of the nature of the region. I mean, the, the, the Africa is much more uh, rural-based, and therefore agriculture becomes much more important uh, because it's also, you know, the highest employing, you know, sector in most of the countries. But both on-farm on -farm and off-farm, you know, employment is important. As long as the employment process and the jobs themselves are decent jobs, jobs that, uh, that, that uh, uh, you know, protect labor standards, jobs that ensure that there's social protection, jobs that ensure that there's a good income that, uh, you know, people get uh, with the dignity, jobs that ensure that their contracts, fundamental rights respected. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ken. Let me also uh, take the liberty of including one last question from the panel, and then I'll, I'll make sure, uh, Frank, to, to close this session as soon as possible before we get back to, to Bern. There's a question raised by Gerardo Pataconia, I think of the ICO, the International Coffee Organization, that relates to uh, the um, inclusion of environmental services that seem to be identified, for example, in the coffee producing regions. Job opportunities in environmental services seems to be identified. Is that true in all rural areas? Who would like to take this question actually, which is very specific? No takers. In coffee, youth employment is linked to efforts towards living income to make attractive for young women and men. What do you think? How do we link this to the uh, discourse of environmental services? Ben, would you like to step in here? 
I'm happy to step in. I don't want to dominate the discussion. <laughs> Absolutely, <yet>. go on. <laughs> this is the last question anyway. Right. <laughs> no, that is an important point. And then actually it, it suits me because I have, I used before my time at ILO, I have done research in coffee. So, so I can relate to that. The, the, and, and, and one finding that that's research was on fair trade and employment outcomes and so on. I won't go into details, but the major finding was that we, what we found more sustainable type of uh, production and, and, and a better quality type of, I mean, quality of output, better beans, better quality coffee, that tended to have much, much better employment outcomes, both in terms of the quality and the number of jobs, because it's more labor intensive, you need to take more care and so on. So actually focusing on higher quality type of outputs, higher quality value chains, and I think this goes across all sectors, not just coffee, uh, can be very important. Now, helping, and, and there's a business argument for that, of course, because then those, those value chains fetch higher prices and so on and so forth. Now, I, I can perfectly see how then in, uh, environmental service can be an important service for those farmers who want to get access to these markets uh, to, to, to then get help from these services to ensure that they, they fulfill the standards and so on forth. And I think that can then also benefit more creation of, of workers for the, on the farm and so on and so forth. So, so I think that's a great point. I think there's many of these type of examples. And actually what I wanted to say in my final slide there, if you remember, is we need to be innovative about this. We need to think outside the box, not just agricultural services, not just irrigation schemes, not just new breeds of goats or new seeds or this or that, but actually think about the social rec uh, relations in the rural sphere. Think about the labor market. How can we make help, especially the poorest people there to, to find better jobs, find more jobs and so on and so forth. That, and, and I think there's a lot of new things that we can try there. Thanks. This is great, Bernd. And uh, Syriac, yes, would you like to chip in? 10 seconds, please. Just a quick question. Wait, uh, I don't know just to, to go into deeper details about this very fascinating question, but uh, above the, uh, in addition to what Bernard has just uh, you know, mentioned here, when you start bringing in the environmental elements here, then that brings back to really thinking very carefully in how production system is being uh, structured. What kind of production system are we looking at? And uh, which has what impact and what outcomes in both in environmental terms and the job creation terms. That is at the center of these particular questions. And there's a huge question that I don't think that we have uh, enough uh, uh, time to discuss here. I will leave it there. Thanks, Syriac, really much appreciated. And before I really give the floor back to Frank, one last question for Baron. Now, how does the panel discussion resonate with your findings? Could you just provide a one or two minute uh, wrap up, Bernd, and then we give the floor back to Frank. Thanks. I think it does. I, I think it was very, um, uh, it seems on the big issues we are agreeing. So the, the, the bigger question is how do we operationalize this? And, and maybe let me just add one point that might be important here. The type of things that I alluded to in my presentation, they don't lend themselves to quick project implementation, unfortunately. These are big picture, long-term issues, as Jane has also said. How do, we, how do we translate that into development projects that always want to have uh, quick results, those that are measurable, that's, that, that satisfy the, the evaluation report at the end of the project, that can say X number of people have benefited from this and so on and so forth. Those type of incentives, of course, lend themselves to the type of projects that maybe are not as structured. If we want to do a skills development scheme or an entrepreneurship project, sure, we can quickly count the people that have benefited and job done, so to speak, uh, a bit flippantly. But actually, how do we make sure that we stimulate demand in the rural area? This is much more long-term, much more difficult and probably much less easy to implement. I think those are the questions we need to, on this platform, need to think about in the longer term, how we can do that. Thanks. But otherwise, I agree. It was a great discussion, and then I really enjoyed this. Thanks to all. Thanks a lot, Bernd, and uh, thanks a lot to colleagues for this really enticing and productive session. I really appreciate uh, where the conversation is going. Uh, there is a lot of potential in what we are doing here with this uh, working group. Thanks to all distinguished panelists for their contribution today. 
And back to you, Frank. Yeah, thanks also from my side, Mauricio, dear panelists and all the participants. I think that was really a rich discussion. And I don't want to really add more because I think uh, I fully agree with Bernd. You summarized it very nicely. I think it's really about the combination to strike the balance between a conducive policy framework, now, which is basically um, the, the responsibility of the partner countries now, of the policy level, and to support that through a better coordinated the donor approach uh, or concrete project interventions, which really work on different aspects of, of an overall strategy. But structural transformation is a highly, incredibly highly complex pro process, now, which is very difficult to steer and to support. Uh, so coordination is really, really needed, and there are only context-specific solutions. So there's no one-size-fits-all. That's clear. So yeah, but I think this is, was just the beginning of an interesting discussion, and I think also for us as the Global Donor Platform Working Group, no, this is, was just the first kind of webinar we had in, in um, this context. And I think it's really helpful to bring together the different perspectives, not to exchange uh, what we have, uh, the findings, the results uh, we have uh, to learn from each other and also to uh, somehow to work towards a, a common ground, which we can also then link in and link back to ongoing policy processes like the Food System Summit, of course, but also the Committee for Food Security. They are developing policy guidelines on the topic. No? So I think there are different entry points no? which are highly re relevant to our group. So we are very much looking forward to this and maybe just to announce as the next um, event we are going to organize is a joint independent dialogue for the Food System Summit on 30th of June uh, with the topic on African youth as drivers for decent job creation in sustainable food systems. And maybe you can just also share the link and we are very much looking forward to maybe uh, meet some of the participants also there. And with this, Thanks also for your extra time and have a good day, everyone.